Hello and welcome to Navarra FM, broadcast on Resonance 104.4 FM, London's most sidereal of radio stations. I am James Butler. Three weeks on from the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, and the Teflon prince, Mohammed bin Salman, appears to be in a crisis. But why has this killing, among so many others, stuck? And what is the nature of the Saudi state? And perhaps, most importantly here, what is Britain's relationship to the Gulf monarchies and its role in the war in Yemen? Joining me to discuss these questions is David Wearing, author of Anglo-Arabia, Why Gulf Wealth Matters to Britain. And let us begin then just by recapping the reaction both in Saudi Arabia and internationally to the Khashoggi killing. Everyone from the Saudi regime to their Western backers has got the incentive to they just want this to go away, right? They, you know, they want this issue to just, you know, disappear and for it all to be smoothed over. And if you if you track the responses, someone should do a timeline of how responses have changed and how tone has changed um, since the since the guy disappeared, which is second of October. So this has really gone mm. on now. This is three and a half weeks of, of this story. It's a big story. Um, I think what you find if you if you track the responses is that. They've gone from dismissive, or not dismissive, but low key, to increasingly strident from the West. Um, and every juncture, they've tried to be like, okay, so that will do. The Saudis have given us, you know, a statement which is, you know, a good first step. And then the Turks will leak some information. And then two days later, you know, the day after, Trump will say something complete, you know, mm-hmm. something much stronger, or May will say something much stronger. Um, and the Saudis have really been forced in a kind of farcical way to go from total denial to coming up with weird stories about how Khashoggi was killed in a fight, like a fist fight between yeah. a 60 year old journalist and a 15 man hit squad, one of them armed with a bone saw. Um, and we've now got to the point where, largely due to leaks from the Turkish government, the Saudis have admitted that the guy was killed and... Well, first they had to admit, yeah, they had to admit mm-hmm. that he was killed at all because first they were saying he just left the consulate and they came out with some... They used some body double to convince people that someone... Com- yeah, I mean, maybe maybe listeners don't know about this, that they got someone to dress up in his clothes yeah. with glasses and a fake beard. And then go sightseeing <laughs> in Istanbul. Yeah. They didn't mention anything about this, but they're obviously hoping that the Turkish authorities would see this on CCTV and say, oh, well, he's fine. Look, he went sightseeing and then he disappeared. Um, <laughs> it's like a carry-on film scripted yeah. by Jean Le Carre. You know yeah, I mean? it, did, it felt sort of carry-on up the Bosphorus and carry-on <laughs> assassinating or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it was, nuts. Yeah, yeah, and but the guy was wearing the same trainers as when he walked into the, the you know the the Saudi body double. Was, he looked was nothing like... like him. He looked nothing like him. It's, it's amateurish. A lot of this is yeah. there's a lot of amateurishness in this. Um, in the way the Saudis have handled the story mm. has been ridiculous. Yeah, uh, and and almost designed to make themselves look worse and worse and worse. The denials, the aggression at one point, mm-hmm. saying if you you know if you mess with us, the West will like. We've got ways of hitting back at yeah. you, which they immediately had to backtrack very quickly. You know, other officials had to come out and say, no, you can trust us as responsible producers of oil and all the rest of it. Um, I think all the way through, they've been getting an object lesson in where power lies. Mm. Um, it, it strikes me as the behaviour of, of absolute monarchs who are used internally to be able to do whatever the hell they want to, whoever they want. And particularly now a crown prince who has been very aggressive in the last couple of years and never had any pushback domestically or from Saudi's international backers Mm -hmm. and got the idea that he could do whatever he wanted and got the idea perhaps he had the West where he wanted them. Um, But clearly not. Mm -hmm. I think they they are learning now in, in, in really stark terms is where the power lies. So that, that's how things have unfolded. I think the Saudis have gone from belligerence to, to backtracking quite quickly. And now they're at the point where they're saying, OK, uh, we, we, um, we're coming to the conclusion it was a pre- premeditated murder. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> and um, th- th- their big problem is that it's 
it seems very clear to me from the evidence we've seen so far that it was premeditated and ordered by the mm. Crown Prince himself. Mm. And this is their big problem. It's very hard for them to see how they can come up with a convincing story that says it wasn't the Crown Prince. Mm -hmm. And if they can't do that, it's hard to see how the Saudis reset their relationship with the rest of the world and with the, their Western backers upon whom they're dependent mm -hmm. without getting rid of him. The problem yeah. being that he's the son of the king. And he's the favourite son of the king, who the king has always doted on, apparently. And his appointment would reflect badly on the king. Mm. Now, if the king's not willing to get rid of him, and if the, way to, if the only way to reset the alliance of the West is to get rid of him, then potentially there'll be Saudi princes who'll be thinking, well, they've both got to go now. Mm, mm, mm. Um, so we'll see how things pan out. But it's, it's still up in the air. It's still developing... The role that Turkey are playing is really important. Yes. Um, shall we say something yes, about that? Yes, let's. So why are Turkey behaving the way they did, um, where they have? Um, if you'd asked me this two weeks ago, I would have said Turkey has its price and at some point they'll engage in a, they'll, they'll collude in a cover-up or a smoothing over of this in return for something like a reset of their relationship with the United States, which has been poor recently, and perhaps um, a large injection of Saudi petrodollars mm -hmm. to deal with their um, their economic problems, which have become particularly yeah. acute in the last few months, including a currency crisis, which would be nicely offset by Saudi petrodollars coming in. That's what I thought three weeks ago. And yet that moment when they say, oh, OK, it's all fine, we'll smooth it over, has not come. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, they have kept uh, leaking information. At every point when the Saudis are put out, put out a new story, the Turks have put out more information like the day after, mm -hmm. contradicting it. Backing the, and the Saudis have had to be back... The Saudis have been backing down in the face of that. Mm -hmm. And the British and the Americans have been backing down in the face of that. So, for example, um, the other day when the Saudis said it was a rogue operation and the Turks put out new information showing it, it couldn't have been. Mm -hmm. um, the West went from saying... Thanks, Saudis, that's a good start, to a couple of days later saying, OK, this isn't good enough, it's not mm. credible. So at every point when the West have tried to quieten the story down, the Saudis tried to quieten it down, the Turks have kept mm. it going. So why, after three weeks, are they still doing that, if it's just money and, mm -hmm, the, and mm -hmm. the reset of their relationships that they want? I think there's a geopolitical aspect to it. Well, I say I think. I think a few people have come to the conclusion that there's a geopolitical aspect to it. If you think about... International relations in the Middle East at the moment. One of the divide people always talk about Sunni and Shia, which I think is incredibly facile and, and essentializing to the mm -hmm. point of being racist. Um, a better, this is one of the divides, so I don't want to substitute one simplification for another. Um, but perhaps a more relevant divide is between the, the Saudis and the UAE and the Egyptian president, perhaps, as well, as being forces who are against what I would broadly describe as political Islam mm -hmm. or, you know, conservative um, political Islam, so like Muslim Brotherhood and forces like that. Mm -hmm. And the UAE and the Saudis don't like forces like the Muslim Brotherhood because they represent a republican form of governance mm -hmm. which is legitimated by Islam. And... That's scary to the Saudis who are a monarchical system legitimated by Islam because it's effectively mm -hmm. saying for the religiously legitimated rule, you do not need kings. Mm. You can have a republic. It's the same reason the Saudis are scared shitless of the Iranian revolution, which has nothing mm -hmm. to do, I don't think, with Shiism. It's more to do with the fact that this is a republican um, kind of republican form of government, mm -hmm. which is a threat to theirs. Um, so you've got a dividing line between the Saudis, the UAE, and um, uh, General Sisi in Egypt on the one hand, anti-Muslim Brotherhood kind of axis, for want of a better word. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Qatar, who've always backed the Muslim Brotherhood as being their kind of soft power strategy responding to the Arab Spring. They thought when the Arab Spring plays out, Muslim Brotherhood partners will be in peril all over the Middle East. We'll, we, our links to them will make us give us strategic mm -hmm. depth. And the Turks, who are... The AKP isn't Muslim Brotherhood, but it's similar, you know. Um, and I think this is Turkey as part of that side of the divide trying to weaken the anti-Muslim Brotherhood or anti-political Islam side of the divide in the Middle East. Because Mus uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince, is um, <clears throat> one of his 
big geopolitical priorities was pushing back against this Muslim Brotherhood mm. type axis or this political Islam axis, so the blockade against Qatar and all the rest of it. Um, so I feel like Turkey is po- yeah. basically trying to use this to weaken the Saudis and, if possible, topple the crown prince. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it also comes, I think, at a difficult time, particularly for uh, for the Saudi state, because it's mm. at a moment where it's uh, looking outside of itself yeah. um, because it needs to diversify its source of income from oil. Yeah, yeah, and now yeah. this is this has been part of MBS's big project, the the Saudi Aramco yeah. stuff and move away from, from reliance on oil looking where the, the world is going. Yeah. So how does that play into what's going on at the moment? This is a disaster for that. It's a big, big disaster for that. So their their issue is that still 80 years, 90 years after the kingdom was first established, the, the, the economy is still basically very reliant on oil. Um, and they, they urgently need to diversify. Um, the, partly because of partly because of climate change, actually, and partly because of renewable, te- renewable, renewable technologies, electric cars and things like this are, are, are terrifying to them because if people stop needing oil, because there's now a, a more efficient, cheaper form of transport available, as well as the fact that people are starting to realise that we've got to deal with this climate emergency. They're in trouble. Um, look at China putting huge amounts of money into renewables, partly because they're energy poor and dependent on energy imports, particularly from the Gulf. And that's a huge strategic mm. weakness for China. The majority of Saudi oil exports go to, go to East Asia. If East Asia decarbonizes, that's mm. their source of income cut off. So they're trying to, and also increasingly they need a higher oil price to, for their budget to break even. Um, because in the big oil boom during the 2000s, they splurged all that money, and now they've got themselves to a point where oil has to be worth at least $80 a barrel, and a lot of the time it isn't. So, yeah, they're trying to diversify. How do you diversify? You diversify by attracting foreign investment into different areas of the Saudi economy that are underdeveloped, um, from you know entertainment to high technology to, to whatever. And... You're attracting inward investment from, from the West, not because you need the money. You've got money, but you need the technical expertise um, and you need the managerial expertise. Like, you don't know how to set up an entertainment industry. You've never done that before. But all these Western companies like View Cinemas and what have you will do that because they've just sort of opened cinemas in, in, in Saudi at last after a, a couple of decades of having them shut. Um, well, now all these companies are pulling out. Mm-hmm. You know, View just cancelled their, you know, the yeah. contract that they were entering into. There was a big investment conference in uh, Riyadh earlier this week, and they just hemorrhaged guests. Mm-hmm. Like big CEOs of major firms, major Western firms were pulling out left, right, and centre. Why? Because the Crown Prince is toxic. And if you've got to choose between, on the one hand, doing business in the Saudi market, which is, yeah, it's big in global South terms, it's not that big certainly not big in global north terms. Mm. You've got to choose between doing business there or, you know, destroying your reputation. And if you do that, you destroy mm. your reputation among, amongst global north consumers. What are you going to choose? Mm. I mean, it depends where your business is calibrated. If you're BAE and if you're Total, like an oil company or something, then, yeah, OK, you'll take the reputational hit in the West because you need the Saudi market. But if you're anyone else, mm. the big firms that they need to come and invest... You know, you don't want to seen de- be seen dead yeah. with, with um, Ben Salman at the moment because of so, what everyone thinks. So this is all part of his kind of Vision 2030 yeah, stuff. Yeah, this yeah. is his name for it, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm right in thinking, isn't it, that, 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 that McKinsey had a substantial part to play in developing this. There was a big input from sort of management consultancy people. Yeah, yeah, how yeah. You'll, you know, how to, how to run a sustainable, uh, a sustainable economy post-oil. Mm. It's... They want to sell off, I think it's 5% of Aramco, the big kind of state-owned right. yeah, yeah, company. Yeah. Um, and that requires floating it somewhere. That's right, but yeah. that looks like a problem now. That's a big problem. In fact, that was a problem before, mm-hmm. um, and a problem which is perhaps insurmountable. So on top of the fact that Western businesses don't want to deal with the Saudis anymore because they're so toxic, um, their problem with Aramco, which is the nationalised oil firm, um, 
which was originally set up by the Americans by Chevron and one other American company whose name I forget in the um, in the forties. The Saudis nationalised it in the early seventies, not because they really wanted to, but because Arab nationalism was a thing, a big thing mm-hmm. at the time, and they were trying not to look terrible in front of their population, many of whom were sympathetic to Arab nationalism. So they nationalised the oil company. Um, it's now a huge firm in global terms, but it's not listed on the stock exchange. Why? Because you need to be transparent. Because people buying shares want to see your books. Mm-hmm. They want to see what they're buying into. And the big problem with Saudi Aramco is it's not a proper company. It's a piggy bank for the Saudi royal family. It's not run in the way that um, a more transparent Western PLC might mm-hmm. be run. So to get onto a Western stock exchange, you need that level of transparency. And... Clearly, Western stock exchanges would love to see a multi-billion, maybe trillion dollar uh, flotation mm. on their stock exchange. Think of all, think of all the fees for accountants and lawyers and everyone down the food chain. It would be an absolute bonanza. But how do they justify getting it on the stock exchange? And what the British stock exchange did was create a new category of investor. So that basically, t- I mean, they didn't, you know, say it openly, but it's basically tailored to get Saudi Aramco mm-hmm. onto the British Stock Exchange. At this point, the Institute of Directors and, you know, various people representing British capitalists said, look, you're completely undermining the credibility of British capitalism. We need for our, for this system to function, for there to be a degree of credibility about the sort of firms that are listed. And you've just, mm-hmm. you know, driven the coach and horses through that by letting these people come in. Um... So there are, for all the talk that there is about, oh, we're desperate for Saudi petrodollars and we're desperate for Saudi wealth, there is disquiet within, we'll Mm. talk about this more, there is Mm. disquiet within the ruling class, if you like, about this. And there are plenty of people in the British American ruling class who think this isn't worth it, Mm -hmm. including big business. Whenever the issue of Saudi corruption comes up with oil deals, with, uh, sorry, with arms deals, there were people in the city of London saying to the British government, stop covering this stuff up. Mm-hmm. You're undermining the credibility of British capitalism and British markets, you know. Um, but, yeah, that's another big problem yeah. they've got. They can't float their oil company. They can't attract Western investment. Um, this is going downhill fast mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when that when they ran that investment conference earlier in the week, I was reading the FT coverage, the few people who did go were saying quite openly to the FT, these guys are not running their country properly. Mm-hmm. They're making it impossible for us to do business with them, and they've got to sort it out. So all this, all this disquiet about mm. Ben Salman is well out in the open now. Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's one of the things when people talk about the Saudi state, I'm always hesitant <clears throat> about some of the stuff that gets reported. There's this sort of exotic uh, element to it, you know, this sort of mm. orientalist view on the part of uh, a lot of Western reporting. Nonetheless, yeah, I mean, yeah. stuff like the kind of, simply the family budget, the, yeah, you know, yeah, the stipendiary... Yeah. Yeah. nature of what it means to be part of the house of sold yeah like that that is really striking i mean the budget yeah. for it, i think there's a there was a u.s cable in wikileaks so there was something like you know the the overall um budget for the the family was something like two billion dollars in 1996 so yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> probably yeah. increased substantially now yeah um but i think one of the things that's maybe useful for listeners to hear is a bit about how these, the, the kind of monarchies of the, the Gulf Corporation Council, how these kind of uh, oil monarchies mm. arose, and in the context yeah, specifically yeah. Of, of sort of British involvement yeah, and the yeah, history yeah. of British involvement in the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah, so in my book I talk about this a lot, and this is one of the points I try and stress, um, that, yeah, let's connect this with, with that Orientalist point you made a moment ago, because the way people talk about... The way Western politicians talk about Saudi Arabia is often when they try and justify Britain's support for it is, well, they've got their culture and we've got ours, and theirs is a very different culture with a different set of values, um, and that's the explanation for why it's an authoritarian regime, and we're just working with what we've got. And the point I try and make in my book is that, look, when you trace the, 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 the process of state formation in the Arabian Peninsula over the last 200 years the way these monarchies came into being and entrenched themselves, um, you find the British there every step of the way, every step of the way, um, helping, to, uh, influencing and guiding that process of state formation to ensure that these monarchies were entrenched, often against forces that were, frankly, you know, progressive to a greater or lesser extent, Arab nationalism mm-hmm. or Democrats and, you know, 
small L Liberal Democrats mm-hmm. in the Arab mm-hmm. Spring. Um, so it's not a case of, oh, we just turned up and there they were, you know, we turned up with our exalted Western values of liberal and de- liberalism and democracy, which we're really serious about. And we found these, you know, we've, we found these Easterners with, the, with their, you know, cultural sort of antipathy to our Western liberal democracy. It's not like that at all. Britain's been colluding in authoritarian rule for a long time and entrenching it against prospects of democracy. So if you trace it back to the early 1900s, um, Britain first goes into the Gulf um, in an attempt to create a kind of cordon sentier around the second British Empire in, in India, so to try and protect the Indian subcontinent from the French and the mm-hmm. Russians. Um, so it does deals with the local monarchs. And these, these are just sheikhs who are, who are not wealthy, not necessarily particularly well entrenched along the coast of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, like sort of the, you know, the uh, Sheikh of Bahrain, who recently renamed himself King. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, the Mir of Qatar, um, royal family in, in Kuwait. But these are fair, I mean, these are very, very weak local rulers mm-hmm. compared to the might of the British, Army, of the British Empire. And British, Britain enter, enters into a series of treaties with these guys, protectorates. So as you usually have no foreign policy except through us, mm-hmm. basically. And that continued until 1971. From the, from the mid-1800s to 1971, these were vassals. You know, mm-hmm. that's probably overstating their power. Mm-hmm. They were clients. They were subjects of, Brit- of British power. Um, and throughout that period, as they gained wealth through oil and as they became states in the modern sense, they were under British tutelage. And British officials were there in their governments, you know, in their judiciary, in their civil service, in their military system, in their security system, acting as quote unquote advisors to these to these monarchs. Mm-hmm. The British were there, building these states, you know. Um, up until the late seventies, you had British um, people in, the, in the, you know making up the top brass of the Omani military it was British people. Um, the guy who set up the system of the whole system of torture and repression in Bahrain, which has recently been used to crush a peaceful, mm-hmm. broad-based pro-democracy movement, the guy who set that all up was a special branch officer, former special branch officer called Ian Henderson, who came fresh from the Britain's gulag in Kenya in the fifties, was then seconded or re- recommended by the British government to the Bahraini authorities in the seventies. Turns up, creates a system of surveillance and torture and repression. Mm-hmm which has kept the Bahraini monarchy in place. Um, so it's just a bit rich, I think, for British politicians to say, oh, we just turned up and found mm. it like this. You know, everywhere across the global south, people fought for democracy against the West. This stuff about Western democracy versus Eastern values. They fought for democracy and self-determination against the West. And here's one place where people weren't successful, and one of the main reasons is because the West made such a successful effort to build up authoritarianism. Mm. Um, similar with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is created very late in the day. It's a case of a kind of basically, uh, you know, people who are advocates of a very austere, extreme form of Islam breaking out, breaking out of the Central Arabian Desert, conquering as much of the Arabian Peninsula as possible, and subjecting the diverse populations to mm-hmm. their particular brand of quite unfamiliar autocratic rule, including uh, Shia in the east of eastern of um, the Arabian Peninsula and the population of the Hejaz along the west, including Mecca and Medina, mm-hmm. which because of its interlinks with the rest of the world, because of the pilgrimage, were actually quite liberal and mm-hmm. quite cosmopolitan. They had bordering, something bordering on a free press, which was just crushed by the Saudis when they conquered the Arabian Peninsula. Um, yeah, so... This, this process of state formation has been one where the West have colluded mm-hmm. for a long time to ensure the dominance of authoritarian rule. And relatively weak authoritarian rule, rule I, I assume, is more useful uh, in that sense because it allows, you know, it, 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 or it necessitates a kind of dependency, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what you have. That was um, an, an approach by the Europeans <clears throat> throughout, from mm-hmm. the, the British and in Iraq, back in the Sunni minority, the French in Lebanon with the uh, Maronites, the French in Syria with the Alawites, mm-hmm. pick a dependent, pick a minority, build them up, make them dependent on you, and that's that's that's, mm-hmm. that's divide and rule mm-hmm. in, in, in 
in, if we understand it in a more sophisticated yeah. and accurate way, that's yeah. what it looks like in practice. Yeah. And these monarchs, with their lack of um, their lack of broad popular legitimacy, um, what were, were ideal? Mm-hmm. Yeah, dependence. So, what happens when you get the end of empire in, mm. in that sense? What happens when the British start to withdraw? And why does that happen? Right. So, the British are until are there until seventy one, and you know, if you know anything about sort of British post-war economic history, you know it's a series of balance of payments crisis, a series of currency crises mm-hmm. in the forties, and then in the sixties. Um, and in the sixties, the currency crisis of sixty-seven leads the Wilson government to say, "Look, we just can't afford empire anymore. It's too much of mm-hmm. a too much of a cost which we can't bear." Um, and so they decide to withdraw British tr- um, forces from their permanent pres- presence east of Suez. If anyone you know, any of your listeners read about the withdrawal from east of Suez, that's what that is. So we're going to stop our permanent, and end our permanent presence in the Far East and in the Gulf as well. So we will not be the protector of the Gulf regimes and the hegemon there. And there's huge resistance to that from the Gulf regimes. Don't leave us, for God's sake, you know. And frankly, if it hadn't been for the fact that Israel just smashed up Arab nationalism in less than a week in mm-hmm. 1967, the British might not have wanted to do it. Mm. But because they felt that Arab nationalism was at least weakened, they felt they could just about get away with pulling out, provided they built up the um, the, the local rulers a mm. bit more. The Americans didn't like it either. They said, look, we're busy with Vietnam. We needed you to kind of look after this part of the world on behalf of uh, Western capitalism you know, to stop it falling into the hands mm. of Arab nationalists mm. or someone else. So, but yeah, that Wilson's retort to LBJ was basically, look, we can't afford it, mm. so that's it, you know. And <clears throat> what they did afterwards in the 1970s, and this coincides with the oil uh, crisis, when these Gulf regimes suddenly became very rich as a result of nationalising their oil reserves and jacking the price up, they spend all that money on Western arms. Mm-hmm. So, and this is where the new relationship takes takes place. So you've got um, huge oil revenues flowing into the Gulf regimes, um, the massive sort of uh, surplus of petrodollars. What are we going to do with all this money? Well, say the West, we've got some ideas. You could invest it in our economies um, and you could buy our arms with it. Mm-hmm. And you could build yourself up with our arms. You could help us sustain our own, our own arms industries through exports. And that would in turn give us the capacity mm-hmm. to continue projecting military power, which protects you as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a great deal all around. Um, and, yeah, the relationship has basically been about that since then. Mm-hmm. My book is called yeah. Anglo-Arabia, Why Gulf Wealth Matters to Britain. And the argument I'm basically making is that it's not so much about oil, it's about the money that comes mm. from oil, as far as the British are concerned. How do you get that money into your economy using your old imperial relationships mm. built up over 200 years to, um, you know, sustain your military industry, finance your current account deficit, blah, blah, blah. Because it is an interesting question, because as you were saying, you know, in global north terms, yeah. you know, these economies are, you know, th- you know, they're substantial, but they're not, you know, earth-shatteringly no, no, no. important. Yeah. And one of the things that I found most striking about your argument is that, you know, so one of the things that happens... On the left is like any kind of global conflict. You'll have someone going, "Well, well, it's all about the oil." Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But and it may or may not be. Sometimes it is. Yeah, um, yeah. Often it is. Yeah. But the question of why oil matters, mm, mm, I think, mm. is is the question you raise, and you talk about it in two two senses: one one of power and one of money. Uh, yeah. And you put power first analytically. So if you delve into that a bit for yeah, us. Yeah. So oil is the lifeblood of the world economy, to put it, you know, I was about to say to put it crudely, and then it sounds like some <laughs> dad joke, doesn't it? I say, the, old, the older I get, the worse my jokes get. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's structural power. It's the lifeblood of the world economy. The world economy, as we know, it can't function without oil. Hopefully it can in the future, we're all screwed. But at the moment, and for the last hundred years or so, that's been the way it is. And oil is not just about um, the cost of running your car. It's about the cost of transport, and that means it's the cost of transporting not just people but goods. So anything that has to come get from A to B to be in the shop for you to buy, the price of oil affects the price of that. You know, the mm-hmm. price of oil affects the price of food, the price of, price of goods. Um, oil um, is also at the root of plastics, petrochemicals, fertilisers. You know, all these things uh, are important mm-hmm. for 
feedstock for various industries. So the price of oil has, has knock-on effects on, on, on the price of everything. Um, and so, you know, that, that global power that sits on the oil heartlands of the planet has huge structural power in the global systems. If you, were, if you want to think about it in a kind of Horford McKinder geopolitical kind of mm-hmm. way of looking at the world... If you want global hegemony as a big power, whether you're the British, um, you know, six or seventy years ago, or the Americans more recently, you've got to be sitting in that part of the world and have your allies, allies right there. Now, that was a question for the British and the Americans at the end of World War Two. We must be con- control of this oil. We must sit in that part of the world and dominate it. Um, it's as Britain's Britain's powers declined. It's those those questions are now above its pay grade mm-hmm. to a certain extent it, but it's committed to American efforts to remain dominant in the Middle East um, because it's committed to American hegemony so the questions for the British now are more let's complement American hegemony in the Middle East for those big structural reasons um, and for us let's um, let's focus on the more commercial aspects as well as the economic mm-hmm. aspects that you know, I've mentioned a minute ago so yeah, I mean it's it's funny you quote in the book the the uh, the uh, uh, foreign secretary so in law who says we must at all costs yeah, yeah, keep yeah. control of this oil. I think yeah, it's yeah, yeah. it is really striking. Um, I wonder then, you know, what role these kind of petrodollars play in the British economy because obviously it's mm. one of the ways in which Britain Britain is no longer the imperialist hegemon. I mean that's. True. Mm. Um, it's nonetheless, obviously, as you suggest, uh, allied very closely yeah. uh, with America. Yeah. But, but where Britain has a distinctive advantage is in having this enormous uh, financial centre mm. mm. um, right at the mm. heart of its economy. Yeah. So how, do they, how does that flow of petrodollars work? Right. So um, an argument I made uh, Guardian article yesterday where I'm trying to bust all these myths that sustained Britain's relationship with Saudi um, despite people's disquiet one of the arguments I make is that look, Saudi Arabia isn't important to Britain per se, it's important to a version of Britain, the current version of Britain and in one sense that's a neoliberal Britain, why is that? Well, as Britain adopted neoliberalism from the early 80s onwards um, that had an effect on the balance of the British economy, obviously, in terms of de-emphasis on manufacturing industry and increasing emphasis on financial services. And the effect of that is that Britain develops a trade deficit. We're buying more from the rest of the world than we're selling to them, particularly in goods, obviously. Um, and when you develop a trade deficit, um, and I talk about it more broadly in terms of the current account deficit, so it's all kinds of money coming in and out, um, deficit on investment income as well when you've got a current account deficit that weighs downwards on the value of your currency right because um there's more demand from you for other people's goods which you're buying in their currency than than there is from for your goods and services which people are buying in your currency so your currency is weighed down by this current account deficit now, what Saudi petrodollars do is two things to do with the current account deficit. Because if you if you just have that current account deficit, you'll, you'll, you know, you, you've potentially run into <coughs> problems with the value of your currency. And we know how weak sterling is at the moment. Mm-hmm. We've had an effective devaluation yeah. since Brexit, um, which is really important. So how do you deal with that? Um, one, you try and find areas of the world where you can develop a trade surplus, and that's going to narrow the trade deficit, narrow the current account deficit. And two, you try and attract investment income from the rest of the world. And what Britain's been able to do to make this current account deficit sustainable is use the power of the City of London to attract foreign capital into the British economy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that capital comes from all over the place. A huge amount of it comes from the United States, also from Europe. Um, but one of the big sources of net capital inflows... 20%, the way I calculated it, um, was from Saudi um, because they have these, this huge surplus of, um, of capital coming from the, from the oil boom. Now, that's drying up, mm-hmm. but still. Um, the Saudi capital coming into the British economy plays, plays quite a big role um, in financing the current account mm-hmm. deficit. And the other um, 
benefit of these Saudi of these Gulf petrodollars is that because their economies have been booming up at least up until recent years, their economies are growing and they're big net importers of goods and services, like building up their infrastructure and diversifying or trying to diversify their economies. So um, British providers of goods and services have found a big export market in Global South terms. Mm-hmm. And that means that Britain's been able to develop a trade surplus, a precious, rare trade surplus with the Gulf. Mm. I think Britain's trade surplus with the Gulf, I'm going from memory, but it's my book, so I should be able to remember it. (laughs) Um, I think Britain's trade surplus with the Gulf, Saudi and the Gulf, other Gulf monarchies, is equivalent to or negates its trade deficit with France and Japan. Right. So although... The Gulf monarchies or the Gulf market is not that big a deal in terms of the raw value of British goods and services exported there. In terms of the surplus, that's a big deal. Mm. That's mm-hmm. a big deal. That that addresses yeah. a deficit of two global yeah. north co- yeah. major global yeah, north yeah, economies, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, the the net capital inflow from Saudi Arabia that is is just a big deal, mm. not just in global south terms but generally. Yeah. Um, so that's the role that they play. So you've got on the one hand you've got the rentier economies of the Gulf with their big capital surpluses and on the other hand you've got the British neoliberal economy with its thirst for mm-hmm. capital inflows and its desire for um, uh, anywhere that can provide right. a, glo- a, a trade surplus and the two fit together in that mm-hmm. way. This is a really striking vision of like the, of the you know, neoliberal British economy and these, these kind of ultra-reactionary monarchies and yeah. sort of awful human centipedes like just yeah, yeah, foully yeah. attached to each other endlessly circulating yeah locked in this kind of symbiotic yeah. embi- yeah. Uh, embrace of so, complementary capitalism so I, I yeah i mean I, and i think that's maybe one of the things that that often isn't emphasized in in these discussions is exactly the way in which like <coughs> versions of capitalism are instantiated in each of these states and yeah. the way in which they complement each other rather than looking at it just as a whole sort of system that, that the, there are specific versions of capitalism which complement each other. Totally, you know, totally. And, and what's worth adding to that just briefly is this is not just a question of economics, it's political economy mm. and it's imperialism in, a, in, in global economics mm. because these economic relationships are forged in empire, you know. And one of the reasons they send this money our way is to buy in our support. You know, and one of the reasons they're there to make these decisions is because the British helped set up those monarchies, or at least helped them consolidate mm. their rule, and acts as their protector today against other forces, mm. be it forces from below or or, or threatening neighbours. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is, I think, worth pointing out that, that Britain um, uh, was, uh, you know, a provider of enthusiastic training for many of these states during or prior to um, the various kind of uh, Arab Spring Absolutely. uprisings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bahrain in particular. Yeah, yeah. The, the, oh. So the, uh, you know, broad-based, peaceful, pro-democracy movement in Bahrain at the beginning, they weren't even calling for the end of the monarchy. They were calling for a constitutional mm. monarchy. And they were violently crushed by, you know, which is not to say that Bahraini Democrats have disappeared. They're still there. But that uprising was crushed in early 2011 by Bahraini security forces backed up by an intervening force from the UAE and Saudi. Um, And these were forces armed and trained by the British, you know, doing their job. So that's a good point to segue, I think, or or why you talk about Saudi intervention. Maybe we can talk and we'll come to the war in Yemen Mm. just first about that relationship and, you know, again, they're interlinked, uh, about kind of British arms manufacture. Yeah. Um, and these Gulf monarchies, not just Saudi, mm, um, mm. about how uh, you know how how interdependent they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's take that step back to that post World War Two. It's help. It's helpful, I think, to think think of British foreign relations in, in the context of the sweep of history, and with the background of empire very much in mind, and Britain trying in the post-World War II era to see how it could hold on to as much of its power as possible given the reality of imperial decline and eclipse by the United States. Um, And a decision that, well, okay, the US are going to run the show, they're going to run global capitalism from now on. I guess we'll have to live with that. That's probably the best of all possible worlds from our point of view. 
um, they all want a kind of liberal and financialised capitalism because their capitalism is a bit like ours. Mm. So, OK, great. But within that, we're going to be as powerful as possible. And one way we're going to be powerful is to be a, a power that projects uh, military strength in the world, you know, on an intercontinental basis. So we don't just, um, you know, use our military for defence. It's about projecting power and policing this world system with the Americans, helping them to do it. Um, so that's why British... Britain has aircraft carriers and all these mm -hmm. other, other things that, you know, we, 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 we don't have them to protect ourselves in case the French invade or something like that. It's for policing the world. Mm -hmm. um, well, how are you, you going to support that financially? You know, because are you going to tax the population at some huge amount? Are you going to spend 10% of your GDP on, on the military? Ideally not, especially if you want to maintain that stance politically you don't want to arouse public opposition so how can you make it work economically one way you can do it is by having arms export industry so instead of setting up a production line to make you a load of fighter jets and then mothballing the whole thing and sacking all the workers until 20 years later when you need a new fleet of fighter jets why not maintain those production lines maintain those skills and maintain those jobs and just sell the latest gear mm. to other people in between times. That way you earn a lot of money, you make your military industry um, economically viable. Mm -hmm. You need an independent domestic military industry to be a proper military power. Mm -hmm. A proper military power is not dependent on other powers to provide its weapons. Mm -hmm. You know, People who can pull the plug yeah. if they don't like what yeah. you're doing. So this is crucial to that. And the reason that's become particularly pertinent in the case of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, is that since the end of the Cold War, all the big arms markets have started drying up. Um, I have this graph in my book which shows a very steady decline of British arms exports to places in the world that aren't the Gulf and a very steady increase in, in arms sales to places in the world that are the mm -hmm. Gulf, mainly Saudi Arabia, in the post-Cold War era. To the point where now, in the last 10 years, exports to Saudi alone account for 42% of British exports of arms. So if you need arms exports to maintain your military industry, mm -hmm. and you need a military industry to maintain yourself as a global military power, you need mm -hmm. arms exports to Saudi Arabia to maintain yourself as a global military power. So that is a big sense in which Gulf wealth matters to Britain, yeah. or at least this version of Britain. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's worth, I guess, saying... That, that these these companies companies like BAE, mm. you know they're very strange companies in in one way right because they're so deeply bound up with yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the politics of, of the British state that yeah, I think yeah. you know it's it, it's it's worth thinking of them as an extension of the state rather than as yeah you know, independent entities. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, so I want to come then to the war in Yemen because mm. um, uh, we've got uh, just under twenty minutes talk about it yeah cool which okay. i think is important it is definitely um and i you know it's one of the things that has been pretty awkward actually i think for mm. um for for the british state in particular um during the the kind of aftermath of, of, of the khashoggi affair mm -hmm. um maybe it's best to start just with how the war in yemen started yeah, yeah. um because I think I don't think it's often very clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, in conversation about it. Yeah. So I wrote an article for New Socialist, which really tries to expand on this, um, so people can maybe look that mm -hmm. up. Um, trying to talk about you know, the, the historical background to it. I'll, I'll I'll try and do it quite you know mm -hmm. briefly, and obviously I'm going to you know miss bits out. It's going to be a bit simplified, but if people want more detail, they can. They can go to that article and it's got a long reading list at mm -hmm. the end, so mm -hmm. people want to really get into it, they can, and I hope they do, because mm -hmm. it's really important. Um, I mean, the, the basic simplified version is, like the rest of the Middle East, there was an uprising in Yemen in 2011, and it was an uprising against an entrenched regime led by a guy, um, President Saleh, who'd been there since the 60s, um, and was there from the moment of Yemeni reunification after the Cold War. And Saleh sat atop a, a, a state structure which was riven by kind of tribal and regional kind of divisions. Um, again, you know, Sunni Shia doesn't help us understand these things. There's all sorts of things going on. Saleh is threatened by this uprising. 
And at the point where the uprising happens, the regime splits between Saleh and people within his regime who are a bit concerned that he's trying to replace himself with his son. This goes on all the way through the Middle East, like long-term rulers try to groom their son to take over from them. They piss off their rivals and their rivals start to move against them. Um, big element of what happened in Egypt. So at that point when the uprising happens, the regime splits between Saleh and forces who are against him. The Gulf states think, well, we can't have a civil war in our backyard and we want the Yemeni states to endure. And so let's get rid of Saleh, but maintain the state. And this, I think, was the response of the Gulf monarchies and the West to a whole bunch of different uprisings in the Middle East, basically. We we'll try and maintain our ally for as long as possible. If we have to concede you know, that the ally goes because of the strength of the uprising, let's at least preserve the state. So we preserve the basic mm-hmm. status quo and we kind of give the impression that an uprising has mm-hmm. happened successfully. So they replaced Saleh with his deputy, Hardy, um, who, who wins a famous victory in an election in which he's the only candidate. And he's a transitional president for two years, that's the idea, from 2012 to 2014, and there'll be a national dialogue which, set, which will arrive at a new settlement for Yemen. That doesn't work for various reasons. Yemen's a very complex, very d- divided country. Um, also, all, all, all countries are heterogeneous. Mm-hmm. Britain, no, Brit, Britain's a country of all sorts of complexity to it, but it holds together for various reasons. But when you're a country which is riven by foreign intervention, it's the poorest country in the Middle East, the people who rule it are incredibly corrupt, um, that put stresses and strains on the divisions within a society. If Britain had those problems, it would break up as well. Mm-hmm. So um, the national dialogue doesn't work, and President Hardy is challenged by rebels from the north called the Houthis, um, who, are, who hate the Saudis because the Saudis have been trying to convert them all to this extreme version of Islam that the Saudis signed up to. And so the Houthis hate them. The Houthis sign up to a kind of weird opportunistic alliance with President Saleh, who's stepped down, but who doesn't accept the fact that he should step down at all. He wants to get back Mm -hmm. on the throne. Um, When he was president, he fought all sorts of short wars with the the Houthis, but now they've, they've got together opportunistically. They overthrow the transitional government and take control of the capital, And then the transitional government, which is backed by the Gulf states, um, flees to Aden in the south of the country with the Houthis and Saleh in hot pursuit. Now, at this point, they're overextending themselves. They can control the north. They can't control the whole country. Um, And the Saudis and the Emiratis intervene at this point. This is March 2015 to drive the Houthis back up to the north and ultimately get rid of them and put Hardy back on the presidential throne, if you like. And the war's been in stalemate ever since March, uh, not ever since March, ever since sort of later on in 2015. They, they drove the Houthis back from mm-hmm. southern Yemen. Um, and now the, the Houthis control broadly what used to be called North Yemen. And the rest of it is, there's a, a loose coalition with the Saudis and the Emiratis at the top and then various extremely disparate forces on the ground who don't like each mm-hmm. other. And, of course, this transitional government, which the West says is the legitimate government, but, frankly, no one supports Mm -hmm, them mm -hmm, on the ground. mm -hmm. Um, So that's the kind of mess they're in at the moment. Um, We could perhaps get on to the humanitarian side. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's important. So um, I think the the UN figures, 80% of the population uh, is in need of humanitarian aid. Mm. Um, there's lack of food, lack of clean water, lack of medicine. Yeah. Um, half a million cases of cholera. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. So. Okay, you've got Houthi Saleh forces on one side, and the Saudi-led coalition on the other, trying to restore the so-called legitimate government. Um, the Saudis and the Emiratis have fought their war in two ways. One, because they haven't got much reliable ground presence. They place a huge emphasis on aerial uh, attacks, aerial bombing. Um, they have got a ground presence. They do control land, but, you know, um, this is their big advantage. Mm-hmm. The Houthis don't have an air force. 
the Houthis Sally forces don't have an air force. So there's been just an, an attempt to win the war very quickly. I think Mohammed bin Salman, who was the defence minister at the time mm. the war started, thought he could win a quick war. Um, so just pulverised Yemen at the beginning. They ran out of bombs very quickly. Um, to, to, to the point where they went to the British and said, look, we've run out. And the British said to Raytheon, the British government said to Raytheon, who make these big 500-pound paved way laser-guided bombs, you know that batch of bombs you guys were making for the Royal Air Force? Put that to one side and please rush these bombs to the Saudis because they've got lots of, you know, hospitals and school buses that they need bombing. So I'm sure they didn't really say that. Well, maybe they did. Well, I well, mean, you know, you know, that's what was happening. That's effectively, yeah. yeah. No, that, I mean, that is literally yeah. what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the Saudis from day one were hitting civilian targets. Mm. The first, the very first reports from Amnesty International, days after the war started, said the Saudis were hitting civilian targets, hitting them indiscriminately, not taking due care to avoid civilian casualties. So violations of international humanitarian mm-hmm. law. Within months of this really intense bombing, a panel of experts reporting to the UN Security Council at the beginning of 2016 reported, quote, widespread and systematic attacks on civilian targets. They gave scores of examples of this happening, including one where people were running away from an attack and they were chased and shot up by helicopters. Mm-hmm. So really brutal stuff. And if you look at the reports coming out of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, the world's leading humanitarian uh, UN um, uh, U- human rights organisations, who have had people on the ground investigating this in a very, very careful forensic way, Reports from UN experts reporting to the Security Council, reports from um, humanitarian NGOs like Save the Children, they are all saying the same things, that the Saudis are hitting civilian targets, schools, hospitals, clinics, camps for displaced people, um, funerals, weddings, warehouses. Um, the British government and the American government have been trying to make out like these are mistakes or targeting errors which can be rectified with British and American assistance, three and a half years, no one can see any change in mm. the pattern of attacks. The last UN report to the Security Council said, we can't see any evidence of the warring parties showing any any real mm. attempt to, to, to mitigate civilian casualties. I should point that, that out that the Houthi and Saleh forces, now just the Houthi forces, because Saleh tried to switch sides so the Houthis killed him, so now it's just the Houthis, they are not the good guys. They mm. are no better. They've been fighting the war brutally. But I'm focusing on Saudi Emirati crimes for the simple reason that we are complicit in them. Mm. And it would be pretty hypocritical of us to focus on other people's yeah. crimes when we're, com- when we're complicit in these. Let's talk about that complicity yeah. and, and the role of British companies and just spell out yeah. exactly how uh, involved we are. So I think people have the impression that we just sell them some jets and then say, OK, see you later, enjoy those jets, nothing to do with us. Absolutely not how it works. So what we provide, and people have heard presumably, um, of the big deals that were done by Thatcher in the 80s, the Al Yamama deal, mm-hmm. and then Blair and Brown in the 2000s, the Al Salam deal, to provide fleets of fighter jets, right? And these are the jets, military jets, these are the jets that are bombing pulverising Yemen now alongside American jets. Now, those deals involve not just jets, but they, they are, they're, they're government-to-government military memorandums of understanding, which say, we'll provide you with these jets, scores of them, mm-hmm. whole fleets of jets, and we'll provide you with all the supporting infrastructure that you need to operate those jets. We will provide technical and logistical support. We will provide components and spare parts. We will provide upgrades on those jets whenever we develop them. We'll provide bombs and missiles. We'll provide all this stuff on an ongoing basis. We'll have operatives on the ground in your country in large numbers, this is BAE Mm -hmm. operatives, helping you to sustain the operation of this air force. We will provide maintenance, like deep maintenance, the more serious forms of maintenance rather than the more superficial stuff. And, yeah, whenever you run out of bombs and missiles, we'll provide Mm -hmm. them. So, and Philip Hammond was very open about this at the beginning of the war when they thought it was going to be a quick war. Philip Hammond was Foreign Secretary at the start of the war. And he said all of what I've just said, openly and proudly, Mm -hmm. we have a huge infrastructure, this is virtually 
virtual quotes, the actual quotes are in my book. We have a huge infrastructure, an extensive infrastructure supporting the Royal Saudi Air Force, and we will provide that support. We will provide every form of practical support short of engaging in combat. So when the British government says we're not a participant in this war, that's false. Mm-hmm. The British are not combatants in the war. British personnel are not act- engaging in combat. But the British are participants because they're sustaining the Saudi war effort, just as American, uh, the Americans are doing the same with the planes that they provide. Now, the arms that Britain provide, isn't a, it's not a minority of what the Saudis have got. It's a huge proportion mm-hmm. of it. You know, it's virtually balanced between the Americans and the, and the British. Um, Bruce Riedel, who is a, um, a long-time CIA analyst, he's now at the Brookings Institution, absolutely impeccable establishment credentials, mm-hmm. said early on in the war, um, basically, that the British and Americans could pull the plug on this war any time mm. they like because the Royal Saudi Air Force can't operate for any length of time without British and American support. I think this is what people fail to understand, that we are sustaining this bombing campaign, which we could stop when we wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's worth stressing as well this argument that says, oh, we could just, you know, they could get their arms from the Russians and the Chinese. No, they couldn't. You can't just replace a fleet mm. of fighter jets mid-war on yeah. top of all yeah. the, the support sustain, that sustains those operations. Perhaps you could replace it in the medium to longer mm-hmm. term. It doesn't help you fight this war. Mm. So the war can be, you know, the, the Saudi bombing campaign can be stopped mm. immediately whenever the British and the Americans want to, but they don't want to. So in a sense, I, I guess that's my final question for you, really, is this, the the Khashoggi affair and the sort of PR crisis mm. that's surrounding the regime yeah, and this kind of, structure of mutual dependency is this an opportunity or would it be an opportunity could it be an opportunity to begin to change that yeah yeah so what the point i've tried to argue is as i say is that saudi britain per se does not need saudi arabia but this britain does um a britain that is a neoliberal economic model which needs as a current account deficit that needs financing and it needs um uh, export surpluses with, with wherever it can find them and a post-imperial Britain is trying to hold on to its role as a global military power a second tier global military power now if your listeners like neoliberalism and like British military power <laughs> then they will value Britain's relationship with Saudi Arabia if they don't there are alternatives um, you can have an in, you, if you have an industrial strategy um, you and you rebalance the economy away from financial services to export industry you can close that current account deficit, obviating the need for capital inflows and reducing the need for um, export surpluses wherever you can find them because you'll be building up your exports generally. Um, if you don't feel that Britain's role as a kind of you know, global policeman on behalf of US-led capitalism is a good thing that makes people safer um, and you might, you know, you'd be reasonable and come to that conclusion, then... Um, why would you need an arms industry? Because the arms industry doesn't support the British economy. It's not massively important to the British economy. British exports, to all British exports to Saudi Arabia in the peak year of arms sales of 2015 were 1.3% of British exports worldwide, virtually a rounding error. Mm-hmm. And half of that was military, yeah. so less than 1%. Um, so we don't need it economically for the economy as a whole. It's needed for the arms industry. Mm-hmm. And if you don't think we need the arms industry, fine. We don't need the Saudis. We don't need the arms exports there. Um, if you're going to have an industrial strategy, hopefully it's a green industrial strategy, you'll be looking for personnel and skills and resources. Well, why waste all these skills and resources in the British arms industry where we could take those people and the resources that subsidise the British arms industry and put it into the development of green mm-hmm. technology? Mm-hmm. You know, so there are all these alternatives absolutely readily available to us, and hopefully someone within Labour is doing the policy mm-hmm. work to plan out mm-hmm. how all this happens. People in think tanks should be doing that work. Likes of IPPR should be including yeah. this yeah. this kind of transition away from arms exports in their work on mm-hmm. industrial strategy and stuff like that. So all of this is, you know, we are not forced to do any of this. You know, it's some teetering, weak, dependent 
monarchy in the global south is not making us do bad things. We're choosing to mm-hmm. do these things and we can choose to do other things. And, you know, when at a point when the blockades that the Saudis and the Emiratis are imposing on Yemen, the richest countries in the Middle East blockading the poorest country in the Middle East, at a point when that blockade is now has now placed 14 million people on the brink of starvation, with the UN and the aid agencies now warning of the worst famine in a hundred years, mm. comparable to Ethiopia in the eight is the USSR, um, these you know huge biblical famines mm. of the modern era. At that point, when our relationship with the Saudis has helped to cause something like that, I can't think of a better point for us to say, right, let's look at this relationship and we have to change it. Mm-hmm. How do we change it? And that's all we have time for this week. Thank you so much to David for joining me. This has been Navara FM on Resonance 104.4 FM. We will be back at the same time in the same place next week. Bye-bye.